This week, smashing particles, a spinning house, and a trip to the birth of the universe. Right now we're talking. How did it all begin? What happened at the Big Bang? What is the universe made of? These are the questions that I've come here to find out. Please enter your eye. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Your identity has been verified. Just outside Geneva, straddling France and Switzerland, is the European Organisation for Nuclear Research, CERN. A massive coming together of scientists who are looking for the fundamental building blocks of the universe. I think we have it. You agree? Yeah. Their most high profile discovery in 2013 was evidence of the Higgs boson, the particle that gives everything mass and confirmation that science's standard model of the universe is correct. And this is how they did it. Under the ground, a series of four particle accelerators gradually bring beams of particles up to close to the speed of light. Then they're smashed together and the particles are smashed apart. The largest of these accelerators is the one that's made all the headlines recently. It creates temperatures of trillions of degrees and conditions similar to those at the birth of the universe. And now, it's time to head underground. I have a very small head. And meet the beast itself. A hundred or so metres below the surface, a 27 kilometre long loop running under the French-Swiss border. See what we've got. This is the largest machine in the world, the Large Hadron Collider. So this is it, the LHC tunnel. My guide is head of the Beams Instrumentation Group, Rodri Jones, who I leave in no doubt at all about how happy he's made this little geek. Having a moment. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. I don't know what I was expecting, but to be honest, this looks almost too science fiction to be real. Yeah. This enormous collection of components donated by so many countries is a real reminder that this is a truly international collaboration. Science, here at least, knows no borders. What you see here are the what we call the focusing magnets. So it's a bit like your lens in the camera. So when you say focusing the particles down, you mean like aligning them into a, a really narrow beam? You can imagine it's a bit like you with uh, the sunlight and your uh, magnifying glass burning a bit of paper. It's exactly the same thing. Basically, they focus all of the particles that we have uh, coming down here into a very tight spot just beyond the wall. And that's where the collisions occur. And from these collisions, uh, we then look at to see whether we can uh, find these new particles that we're talking about. And getting these two extremely fine beams to collide is no mean feat. And it's Rodri's team who make that happen. You're, in effect, the sniper to, to get these, these beams exactly Exactly. The equipment up. that we build measures the position. We then feed back on the magnet currents and they adjust slightly the position until we're colliding. In. So without you, these beams would probably they never... Would hit never circulate. Yeah. As we turn and head back to the lift, it's worth remembering that although the beams are tiny, the energies involved down here are incredibly high. So high that humans are usually banned from this tunnel. 
We're really lucky to be allowed down here and the only reason we are is because the LHC is switched off for maintenance. If this was running, it'd be far too dangerous for us to be down here. And in fact, we've all been given these little tokens and if any of these are detected by the sensors down here, you can't switch the LHC on. Okay, time to leave Switzerland just for a few minutes. Now, not all of us need as much power as CERN, but in the future we are all going to need more power. The sun is one solution, but it's still quite expensive to first collect solar energy and then store it. Well, Dan Simmons has visited researchers in Germany who want to max out what the sun can do for us. It's free energy, but the technology needed to capture it is still expensive. So when it comes to heating and lighting our homes, some believe the answer revolves around the planet's movement. It's more efficient to move this house to track the sun across the sky than it would be to heat and light it. This is such a weird sensation. Because it's quite steady, it just looks like everything outside is slowly going past. It's the strangest feeling. It's almost like we're not moving, but they are. Researchers are carefully measuring the environment inside and outside the house to see what prompts these two desk workers to open windows, turn on fans or heaters, or adjust the blinds, all of which they can do remotely from their computers. If our homes are to track the sun, but we end up turning on the aircon, for example, we're unlikely to see energy savings. Sophia and Lewis have been willing guinea pigs for this experiment for several months now, with the initial findings expected later this year. For experiments, we are using the rotation um, two ways, um, because we can manipulate how the sun is affecting the people. In winter, you could try to face the sun as much as possible to, to gain the solar radiation and the, the heat through that. Um, but in summertime, you maybe don't want to have it as warm inside and you don't want to have sunshine. So you will just turn your back and keep it cool inside. Now, for most of us, spinning our existing home isn't really an option. So back to those solar panels at Europe's largest research solar park, where they're finding out how to make it all cheaper and better suited to our homes. If you get energy from the grid, you pay around 29 euro cent. Producing your own energy might end up around, around 9, 10 euro cent. So the difference between these 29 and these 9 euro is available for storage. Available for storage means that 20 cent per kilowatt hour saving is at the moment almost completely spent on buying the hardware in the first place. And as most batteries still only achieve four to 5,000 cycles, that storage is an ongoing cost. So the Karlsruhe Institute is looking to match better battery tech with clever control systems to deliver the cost savings solar power has been promising for decades. One idea is to reduce the need to store solar energy. In most solar farms, all the panels would face the same way, usually south in the northern hemisphere to get the most amount of electricity. But here they're testing out pointing the panels in different directions in order to get a more even delivery of electricity across the course of the day. So rather than make as much energy as possible, the idea now is that we harvest it at the same time we use it and reduce the need for those expensive batteries. The panels themselves are starting to deliver about 20% efficiency, so it's now starting to be possible to design power systems, even in Northern Europe, that pay for themselves in 10 years. Looking to the future, architects are imagining how skyscrapers could spin while harvesting solar and, in this case, wind power. But this dynamic tower, or anything similar that could power itself, has yet to be built. And perhaps that's because of a small problem I've found with buildings that move. 
Where's the car? Hello and welcome to The Week in Tech. It was the week that Apple and the FBI went head to head over the unlocking of phones. Apple boss Tim Cook announced that the company will fight a court order that would help the FBI access data on the phone belonging to San Bernardino gunman Syed Farouk. The company says the US government is asking it to hack its own users, whilst the FBI say the phone contains crucial information. It was also the week that Russia showed off some space-age robots. The world's cheapest smartphone was revealed in India for a mere £2.50 and Nissan showed off its self-parking. Cheers. Because you know, the one thing we've all been crying out for is self-parking. Cheers. And if you wondered what DARPA, the Pentagon's Defence Research Division, was up to lately, well, this week they showed off their incredibly fast, fully autonomous quadcopter drone. The UAV is able to reach speeds of up to 45 miles per hour. And finally, if you want a peek at the future, well, here it is. Researchers at Queen's University Canada have shown off a truly bendable, flexible smartphone. The Nimble Mobile is able to measure how much pressure is being put on the flexi screen, allowing you to control the cursor or play Angry Birds like never before. Having been down to the tunnel containing the Large Hadron Collider itself, it's time to come up top and meet the people who actually operate it. The physicists conducting the experiments rely on engineers like Julia Papotti in the CERN control room to make sure the proton beams are injected correctly and the accelerators behave themselves during the process. Can you describe the kind of satisfaction that your job gives you? You're not dreaming up the experiments and you're not sifting through the results, you are operating no. this machine. Uh, yeah, our job is to give the experiments uh, good beam conditions, good collisions. I take pleasure, call it, uh, in when there's a problem, understanding what the cause is. Can I just point out, Julia works on a <laughs> yoga ball. There are some people who would say this could be a big waste of money. What's the point of looking at the origins of the universe when there are more important things in the world to spend the money on? What would you say? It is a lot of money, but there's other things that I think are less useful on which more money is spent. War takes up so much more. Just one plane is comparable. What we're doing here is really, it's the advancement of the knowledge that mankind has on nature. While we're building this, we're learning more about technology, about magnets, about many, many things that can be used elsewhere. Really, really useful and easy to understand is accelerators for cancer therapy. There's a whole world there, and it's the technology that is built for accelerators, but they're used to cure people. All these lights are just concerning regions of the machine that we either allow access or we don't. Each quarter of the control room runs a different part of the accelerator process, and since the LHC was offline for maintenance and things were suitably quiet, I was able to grab some time with Paul Collier, Director of Beams, which is officially the coolest job title in the world. This island is the one that looks after all the basic infrastructure of CERN. So, uh, for example, the electrical distribution system, the cooling systems, the cryogenic systems. You must need a hell of a lot of electricity. We do need quite a bit, yes. I, when, when the whole complex is running flat out, we're drawing roughly 200 megawatts. Does anyone else notice when you go live to the surrounding towns, uh, do the lights no, no. kind of flicker? Uh, no, because they were continually sucking and pushing energy backwards and forwards between us and the outside world. If we didn't have um, uh, what we call compensators, then everybody's lights would follow the 1.2 second pulse of, the, uh, of, of CERN in the Geneva area, and we would not be very popular. <laughs> So instead we have a, a mechanism which damps this out, which means that the outside world does not see this heartbeat uh, of the uh, of CERN. Can I ask about the bottles of champagne? Yeah. There are quite a lot up there. I'm guessing they are to do with discoveries. E discoveries or major milestones for us in the development of the machine. 
somebody normally turns up with a bottle of champagne to celebrate it. It's the Great Cern Champagne Tour for a smashing good time. Congratulations on our very first inverse femto barn. That's an, an amount of data oh, delivered. Oh, your inverse femto barn. Yeah. You never forget your first femto barn, as they Look say. Yeah. That's a good year, that, 10 to the 33. 10 to the 33. <laughs> <laughs> now this, I tell you what, always stay away from bottles of clear fluid in your dad's shed. <laughs> what is that? I have no idea. That says mineral water. That is so not mineral water. I wouldn't... I wouldn't uh, no naked wouldn't flames, ladies and gentlemen. No naked flames. Uh, the Higgs single malt. Do, do the physicists here drink well, or, or do they have one glass of wine and there are any ones? Oh, we, 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 we can manage to, uh, to put it away <laughs> when it's appropriate to put it away, yeah? <laughs> we, we don't drink and drive the machine, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> High five. You've done that one before. Well, it may not be scientifically accurate, but they do say that money makes the world go round. And these days, technology helps give it a little extra spin. And so today, I've joined the suited financiers at the Finnovate conference in the city of London, where the latest apps to help us spend our money are being shown off. If it's simple control of your cards you're after, Vipera is an app that aims to help. It gives options like being able to tell it when you're travelling, so your registered cards will be expecting you to be abroad rather than causing security alerts each time you use them. So here you can input any travel details. You can also select options like not allowing any online payments so that you can choose exactly what you want your card to be used for and when. You can register your cards and then look through your transactions, seeing them turned into some nice, if not a little scary, graphs. Then, from learning your habits, it'll also provide personalised location-based offers, something this event showed there was a growing trend towards. Deutsche Bank have been the first to sign up to using the app, but its success will be dependent on other banks following. Paysend is an app due to be released later this year. It provides a way of being able to make a credit or debit card payment directly to someone else's card. Meaning that if you're paying a friend, or indeed anyone, you don't need to do a full-on online transfer. Its makers hope that it will prove a good solution for easy and secure global money transfers. But of course, there is plenty of competition. They plan to charge a basic 1% plus £1 fee for a same currency payment with added costs for cross-currency transactions. But they will need a licence from the financial authorities first. But the question that this type of tech always comes back to is how secure is all your data going to be? People need to be careful. You need to know the company you're dealing with. Generally, if they're regulated, they're going to be fairly safe to deal with. You can also look at are they working with big established companies like banks and card networks. One of the really interesting things in our research is we see over time people doing things that they said they would never do five years previously. So gradually we all get used to technology. It starts to become normal. Um, so we see more and more people adopting new technologies. In particular, if anything makes something simpler, cheaper or faster, that will often help us overcome the barriers. It's not just securing data we need to think about, though. It's also securing our devices. This isn't the most calming-looking stress ball, but there is a reason for it. Forget fingerprint identification. This is all about iPrint. iVerify's iPrint ID is already being used by some US banks. The level of encryption is equivalent to a 50-letter password, and you don't need to remember anything other than to open your eyes. So we do find that um, we get much better match scores when we use both iVanes and microfeatures. We've tested um, iVane only and we've tested microfeature only and they both work. But when you combine iVanes and microfeatures, you will get a much higher uh, match score. If this takes off, the possibilities go way beyond online finance and then its creators could be laughing all the way to the bank. The work here at CERN is some of the most extreme research being done anywhere in the known universe. 
So far, we've seen the control room and we've seen the Large Hadron Collider itself. Now it's time to see the place where it all happens. One of four locations where those two high-energy proton beams actually collide. Oh. And it is absolutely jaw-dropping. Oh. Right now we're talking. This, for me, <laughs> is hallowed turf. This is called the CMS. It's the compact muon solenoid. Nothing compact about it, if you ask me. <laughs> it's just um, a bit spiritual, really. Fifteen metres across, this Leviathan is a collection of detectors that all focus their attention on what's happening in the very centre and only because it's down for maintenance, only because it's open, can we take you to its very heart. Right, we're now all gonna see something that not many people will ever get to see in their life. The inside of the CMS. So this is where the beam of protons comes, it shoots through here. It collides with another beam of protons that comes the other way. The dead center of this thing is where the collision happens. The debris is flung out, and this massive detector sifts through that wreckage, looking for evidence of new particles, the beginnings of the universe. <laughs> yeah, all right, compose yourself, Spenley. But it turns out that it's not just overwhelming for first time visitors like me. Stephanie Busseron, one of many scientists who churn through the data generated by the LHC, likes to come down here as often as possible. As a physicist, the everyday work is basically being in front of a laptop. And sometimes it's like everyone in the industry, you're frustrated by forgetting why you're doing this work. So coming here and having a view to the detector with also visitors and showing them how great it is, just remind me really why I'm doing such, because this is amazing to see what we can build all together uh, to make some research and uh, discovery as we are expecting. So the job's done now. You've detected the Higgs boson. Switch it off, take it apart uh, no. and move on. No. No? We still have plenty of things to detect. What do you want to detect next? We have still a lot of unknown, like why do we have more matter than antimatter, for example? We still don't understand what we call dark matter or dark energy in the universe. It could be uh, coming from new particles that we are trying to detect in this detector. So we have plenty of things to do. Yep, the LHC certainly has its work cut out for it for at least the next 20 years. The collisions may be tiny, but the impact they'll have on our understanding of the universe and ultimately mankind's path through it will be massive. And I'm really sorry, but that is it from Click at CERN. I don't know about you, but... Um, yeah, it's been emotional. I'm going to stick a ton of photos on Twitter, so at BBC Click is where you will find them. And you can check out our website for more throughout the week, bbc.co.uk slash click2. See you soon.